Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for the Johns Manville Industrial Product Webinar. My name is Kim Melton, and I'm going to be the moderator for today's presentation. Before we dive into introductions, I do want to go into a few logistics. Um, first and foremost, if, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, um, you can submit them at any point via the Q&A feature. And we will address these questions live at the end of the presentation. Now, if you don't see the Q&A feature to the right of your screen, you can look for the series of circular icons at the bottom middle of your screen. Select the icon with the ellipsis in it, and that's going to open a menu, and that'll open an option for Q&A at the top. If you select that option, it will open the dialog box to submit your questions, and that's going to open to the right of your screen. Now, a quick note before we get started, this webinar is for educational purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for professional engineering design, consultation, or documentation that may be required by building codes, contracts, or applicable law. If you have any questions after the webinar, you can refer to our specific application guidelines and instructions located in the product sections of our website. Additionally, we will follow today's webinar with a survey. Now, this is your opportunity to provide us with feedback for how we did today. You can ask any additional questions you may have about the topic of the webinar, or even suggest new topics for future webinars you'd like to hear. Um, we're continuously striving to improve and evolve our webinars. So if you have any comments or suggestions as to how we can better accomplish this, or even if you feel like we've missed the mark today, we encourage you to fill out the survey, and we use your feedback to improve our webinars to provide the information that has the most um, relevant value to you in our future webinars. Now, this survey is also part of how we deliver the JM experience to you. And the JM experience is based on the four pillars of the JM culture, people, passion, perform, and protect. And we believe it's critical to make sure that we hear and understand and respond to your needs in order to deliver the best interaction to you. So we offer webinars like this one to help educate the market and offer a tool and a resource for you and your business. Um, but this isn't just a one-way street, so your feedback is a key component to helping us evolve to better meet your needs. Also, we're frequently asked whether or not we send out these presentations upon their conclusion, and while we don't send out the presentation itself, we do post a recording of it online for you to watch at your leisure, share with your colleagues, or forward to anybody who you think might find relevant. Um, this ensures that you have the presentation within its full context, and we will send an email to you when it's live on our website. So with that, we'll go ahead and get to introductions. Um, I'd like to introduce Heather Sharif, and she's going to take a couple minutes to introduce herself. Hi, thank you for having me. So I'm Heather Sharif. I'm an Applications Engineer and Technical Advisor uh, with JM. I have been um, in the installation industry for two years, and previously I was in the oil and gas industry for uh, just shy of a decade. And I'm Jack Fittner. I'm the um, Senior Industrial Product Manager at Johns Manville. I've been with uh, JM for 16 years, and I've been in the industrial installation industry for 40 years. And we are going to talk about um, our in high temperature industrial products. And then based on the, uh, we, we've added our uh, recent acquisition of the uh, metal jacketing and uh, polyisocyanurate products that Heather's going to talk about with our recent acquisition of ITW. This is an expanded webinar today. I'll start out with some of the reasons to insulate. There's, there's a, you know, there's eight reasons on here. There's probably uh, certainly more, but the two pri primary reasons folks insulate, um, number one is the uh, process control, which is why they, the, the factory or the refinery or whatever the facility is there in the first place, they're trying to make a product. So they have to control the process they have that they're running. That's number one. Secondarily is typically uh, personnel protection. And um, then the other reasons follow, uh, follow behind. Um, this time of year, freeze protection is pretty big, for example. Uh, fire protection is always, uh, always in the back of folks, folks' minds, and the other ones uh, certainly are, are involved as well. But primarily, it's process control and personnel protection. The engineering community also has a series of design considerations that they've got to consider when they select materials. Uh, the design considerations are, are listed there on the uh, left side of the screen. We have a, uh, a part tool, which we call its, its uh, product applications um, uh, rating tool, that helps would help you select your insulation material based on those design considerations. If there was one product that was best in each one of those um, issues, the, uh, listed on the left, thermal performance, CUI, compressive strength, and on, then we would certainly only manufacture one product, but um, unfortunately there's not. Each, uh, we, each product has a place where it performs better than the other, and that's the reason we don't make just one product. 
Um, some perform better in CUI, some have higher compressive strength, so it's going to be uh, uh, located in a high traffic area. Um, you would want to select that one over maybe a, a fibrous product, for example. So um, these are all things the engineers look at. And now I'm going to move into the uh, corrosive potential of insulation. Let me back up here a little bit. Number one on everybody's mind today seems to be, by everybody I mean engineers and owners, when our guys call on these folks, they don't really walk out of an engineering call without some conversation on CUI. And um, you may have noticed here in the last, I don't know, uh, 10, 15 years that the, um, all the materials are now either hydrophobic or in the last few years, uh, water resistant or water repellent. And that's related to the CUI issue. Um, engineers are specifying materials that are either hydrophobic or um, uh, water resistant, water repellent. The, the idea there is with corrosion on the pipes, you've got to the, primarily keep water out because water is, is a key component of uh, corrosion. If you don't have water uh, present on the pipe, you, you're not going to have CUI. So the first line of defense is keeping the water out, and that's why um, the industry has is, is evolved to products that are either hydrophobic or water resistant. And I've just highlighted the products that are hydrophobic. All the rest of the products on this, this chart are water resistant. But the bar chart, what it's showing us here is the mass loss corrosion rate, which is a result of an ASTM C1617 corrosion test for carbon steel. Um, the mass loss corrosion rates of each of these products um, as a result of that test. And when you're, what you're looking at here is uh, some products do perform better than others. And the products that are hydrophobic are kind of all over the board. Same thing with uh, water resistance. What seems to be the, uh, the, the, the driving factor here is um, chemistry. Um, Thermo 1200 and uh, Spruill WR1200 both have uh, XOX, which is a corrosion inhibiting chemistry. Now, I'm not saying that uh, water resistant and hydrophobic doesn't matter. It does. It's, it's just part of the solution, not the end all silver bullet solution. So in the industrial world, you, we've got temperature ranges ranging from cryogenics at 450 degrees um, up to 1700 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, I've listed here all the, well, not all, but the major products that uh, play in the uh, industrial insulation world. Um, the products that are in the white box towards the top of the page um, are products that Johns Manville manufactures and supplies to the industrial insulation uh, business. So I'm going to talk about the high temperature portfolio first. We've got um, five major high temperature products, expanded perlite, calcium silicate, microporous blanket, and mineral wool. We also have some accessories, which I'll uh, talk a little bit about at the end. But I'm going to go into um, a little bit of detail on each one of these products, starting with calcium silicate. Our brand name is Thermal 1200. Uh, calcium silicate has been around for gosh, 40 years probably. It's been the workhorse for the industrial insulation um, uh, world for as long as I've been in the business. And uh, probably longer because uh, it was there, well, some of it was there when I got into it. The benefits of the Thermal 1200 are, the main one is a corrosion inhibitor these days, but it's also got a very high compressive strength. And I've always said for years, the greatest strength of a Thermo 1200 is its compressive strength. And that's true because people, they're not supposed to, but everybody seems to want to walk on pipes. And you need a high compressive strength product to be able to withstand uh, the folks who walk on pipe because some of them are pretty large. It's, it's also been made, we made it water resistant to two years ago. And um, that was in response to uh, some demand from the, uh, from the field. And I'm going to talk about that on the next slide. I thought it was next. First, I'll talk about the forms that we make it in. We make pipe insulation. We make block. We make curved segments. And we also make beveled lags. Curved segments are for large diameter pipes and vessels. They're cut to fit a specific radius. 
and um, they're used in conjunction with or in place of uh, a scored or v groove block. A bevel lag, for those of, you, those of you who aren't familiar with it, is very similar to a curved segment, except it doesn't have a curve in it. It's flat on the top and the bottom. It does have an angle cut on the side, and it's used for very large diameters, starting at 126 inches um, in diameter and, and above. Uh, the features. You're, you can read them there on the left side, and um, the biggest th two things I want to point out are the compressive strength greater than 100 PSI, and the fact that the, the chemistry with uh, Thermo 1200 does include a corrosion inhibitor. Now we'll talk about water resistance. A couple years ago, we held a contractor advisory council and this is where we get a bunch of contractors in the room and we just uh, mainly sit back and ask a few questions and then listen. We don't do presentations or um, any lectures or anything like that. And one of the things that came out of it was the, one of the big hassles for contractors was the fact that calcium silicate absorbed water quite easily, like a sponge, many of them said. And that was a problem for them in the job job site, because the insulators can insulate a pipe a lot faster than the metal guys can apply the metal jacketing. And when you're, particularly in the summer in the Gulf Coast, um, when it's going to rain every afternoon, the job stops and everybody has to, the mad scramble starts to find the visqueen to cover up the exposed insulation so it doesn't get wet, because uh, the rain's not going to drip off it, it's going to suck it up. And that's, that's certainly a detriment to productivity. If there's lightning, nothing's going to get covered because everybody has to, for safety reasons, get under cover themselves. And uh, whatever's exposed has to be replaced. So the result was a project to make calcium silicate water resistant, not hydrophobic, but water resistant. And um, the product we came up with is Thermo 1200 and it absorbs less than 15% water by weight over 20 minutes in what is defined as a, as a moderate to heavy rainstorm, and that's uh, uh, an inch and a quarter an hour on average. It's hard to see the chart at the bottom, but the, uh, uh, the blue line is uh, at 20 minutes, you'll see that uh, Thermal 1200 absorbs about half of the 15%, so we're well under our threshold there. It's about 7%, 7 to 10% really is our average um, moisture by, uh, by weight during that 20 minutes. And um, the uh, yellow line is compared to the old calcium silicate before we made it water resistant, and that would have absorbed 88% of its weight by water. So it's a significant advantage. The main benefits are for the contractors. More time to install the jacketing, um, buys them some time in a rainstorm, which it certainly improves their, their efficiency. And a reminder, it's water resistant, it's not hydrophobic. That wasn't, the, that wasn't the goal, wasn't the scope. It does have the corrosion inhibitor in it, our XOX, and we always recommend that um, any insulation material, I don't care what it is, uh, jacket it as soon as is reasonably possible and certainly have everything covered up at the end of the day that you did insulate um, during the day. And um, what we found out, which surprised me, is um, the engineers like this feature is uh, way more than I thought they would. We designed this for contractors, but engineers like this uh, enough to they're specifying it nowadays. So that was a benefit I wasn't anticipating. I've mentioned the corrosion inhibitor, our XOX, a couple of times already. What is that? <laughs> It's corrosion inhibiting chemistry that provides on-demand protection in the presence of liquid water. And what I mean by on-demand is it takes water to activate it. If there's no water and the insulation is dry, you don't need protection anyway because without water you're not going to have CUI. It's integral to the chemistry. Um, in fact, 90% of the chemistry of Thermal 1200 consists of the corrosion inhibiting chemistry and um, it's been in the uh, material since 2002. Once water is present, it provides a pH buffering and it forms a silicon silicate based coating on the pipe, which actually um, provides, it's almost like a, um, 
oh, uh, passivation layer uh, between the, the pipe and the water so that um, it inhibits corrosion um, by not allowing the, uh, the water and the ions in it to uh, contact the pipe surface and begin the corrosion. One of the questions I get asked is, well, are those corrosion inhibiting products uh, properties present through the life of the system because some of these installations will be there for 20, 25 years? And the answer is yes. Um, I mentioned 90% of the uh, product chemistry consists of corrosion inhibitors, and um, it just doesn't leach out um, and wash out over time. It's there for the life of the system. There are two types of calcium silicon. There's actually three that, that we make. Type one, the calcium silicon specification is ASTM C533. And type one is what we all know and you're, you're, most of you are familiar with is thermo 1200 um, pipe and block insulation. There's also a type 1A, which is um, heavier density. It's only available from us in block. It's a much heavier density, um, about an 18 pound density as opposed to a 14 for um, type one thermal 1200. It also has a significantly higher compressive strength. Um, well, it's up above 200 PSI where thermal 1200 is 110, 120. Um, so it has uh, applications where you on um, pipes and, or not pipes, large diameter um, vessels and equipment where uh, a lot of heavy compressive strength is required. In addition, there is a type two, and that um, is rated, goes above 1200 degrees to 1700 degrees. We offer a product called Super Cal Temp Gold. It's available in uh, board only. We also, uh, also V grouped for large diameters, and um, uh, again, no, no pipe available on that one as well. And I got a couple of FAQs. I may have mentioned or answered these already. How long can, I, can you leave thermal 1200 exposed in a rainstorm? Again, it's rated for a moderate rainstorm for up to 20 minutes with uh, water absorption less than 15%. Is all calcium water resistant? Um, all of Johns Manville's calcium silicate is water resistant. Our thermal 1200 is the only product we made today, make today. We uh, no longer make Thermal 12 Gold. We ceased that in, uh, that was our non-water resistant version. We ceased that in uh, May of 2017, I believe it was. And does the corrosion inhibitor burn off like hydrophobic treatments? It, it does not. One of the things I didn't mention when we talked about the hydrophobic treatments is those, anything that makes a product hydrophobic or water resistant is an organic compound. And anything that's organic under high temperatures is going to oxidize and begin to burn off at uh, 400, 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so uh, once that happens, whatever saw those temperatures is no longer hydrophobic or um, uh, water resistant. And the corrosion inhibitor in, uh, in our XOX uh, chemistry is all inorganic. So it does not burn off like hydrophobic um, treatments. It's there uh, no matter what the temperature and for the life of the system. Now we'll get into expanded perlite. Our Spruel WR1200 is our uh, perlite product. Um, it does, the chemistry there also has the corrosion inhibitor XOX in it. Um, it's always had it in it. The uh, product has very good compressive strength. It's 80 PSI compared to uh, thermal 1200, which was, uh, uh, I mentioned 100. It is completely hydrophobic and um, give, gives good consistent thermal performance. Um, let me see here. I think I mentioned everything on this slide. Primarily the applications for um, perlite historically has been stainless steel pipes um, and, and equipment, primarily um, on the Gulf Coast. And it's stainless steel mainly or primarily because of its performance, good performance with uh, stress corrosion cracking um, that uh, uh, is a problem with uh, stainless steel pipes and water. And the fact that um, the, perlite, the, the WR1200 has both the XOX corrosion inhibitor and high, was, is hydrophobic 
um, has always given really good performance over years, um, particularly the, the Gulf Coast uh, stainless steel pipes. Now it's being used more and more on um, carbon steel pipes as well for the same reasons. Very good performance with CUI and the fact that it's um, hydrophobic and has the uh, corrosion inhibitor in it. So side by side, the Sproul WR1200 compared to um, Thermal 1200, um, one's hydrophobic, one's water resistant. There's a big difference. Water resistant will still absorb some water. Um, it's just less than 20% by weight in the uh, average rainstorm. Compressive strength a little bit less for um, uh, perlite WR1200. Density is a little less, and you'll find that the uh, thermal conductivities with uh, Sproul are higher than uh, a little bit higher than thermal 1200. So you're going to need a little bit thicker typically, um, especially in higher applica higher temperature applications with uh, the Sproul than you will with CalSil. Um, for example, if you need two and a half inches of uh, thermal 1200, you might need um, three inches of uh, Sproul WR1200 based on what you're going to get out of 3E+. Plus. Um, a couple FAQs here. Does hydrophobic mean better CUI mitigation? It's part of the answer, as I mentioned before. It's not the silver bullet. Um, it certainly helps by keeping the water out. The, the, you know, the first line of defense is don't let water in. And uh, so, so, so hydrophobic certainly helps there. Is there any way you can mitigate breakage during transit? Um, per perlite is a more fragile material than calcium silicate. It's a very uh, friable product, so it's one of its weaknesses historically has been um, shipping it and handling it. It's got to be handled a little bit more carefully even during installation than CalSil. And uh, we, <clears throat> over the last year or so, have um, begun putting some foam sheets in the top of our boxes of pipe insulation, which has uh, done a great deal to mitigate the movement of the product in the box during transit. Um, one of the uh, first things it, it used to do when it left our plant was go over two speed bumps. And um, we took those speed bumps out a few months ago, thank goodness. But um, the, and then it, then it makes its way to you. Um, this foam insert on the top really locks the product down into place so it's not going moving back and forth as it, the trucks are traveling down the road. And it's uh, significantly reduced breakage uh, during, during shipping and uh, handling before it gets to your job site. Does Sproul have the corrosion, XOX corrosion inhibitor and does it burn off? No, the answer is the same as it was with uh, Thermal 1200. Um, it does have the XOX and it does not burn off, it's inorganic. Microporous blanket. We have, uh, our product is Insulthin ET. It's not, uh, it's, it's a quilted product and um, it's got very low thermal conductivities. So it would be a, a thin blanket solution for a space, applications where you have space constraints, where you just don't have enough room for three inches of mineral wool or calcil or perlite. It's ideal for uh, hybrid systems where you just have to reduce the thickness a little bit. Um, and it can either, it's also ideal for drying out wet insulation by instead of putting it on the inside of the pipe, as, as you see on the uh, picture on the left, we're putting it on the outside of wet insulation. The wet insulation will dry faster. It's hydrophobic as well. It does not have the corrosion inhibitor in it. Um, we haven't figured out how to do that yet. But um, it does perform, as you saw on the bar chart, still very well in CUI applications. And that's mainly due to its chemistry, too. It's not an XOX chemistry, but it has um, a very good CUI performance due to the fact that the microporous chemistry is, uh, does very well there. There is a phenomenal phenomenon called thermal shift. And uh, you see down here at the bottom, the thermal shift, no, there is no thermal shift with microporous insulations. Um, we have observed the thermal shift phenomenon with um, silica aerogel blankets insulations that we've tested. And um, what, what thermal shift is, is after the first cycle of 
driving the uh, material from ambient temperatures to the high temperature and then bringing it down to ambient and then up again, the thermal conductivities are different. And you can see that in the graph on the left, um, first cycle, second cycle. And that's a permanent shift. It doesn't get worse over time. It happens, it's, it happens once. And um, we've got our blogs on it. We've got um, uh, some presentations that, that get into detail on, on why that and how this happens. But um, it is something that needs to be considered during the design stage because uh, after the first cycle, you may uh, end up with uh, higher surface temperatures than you need. The process may not be operating like um, the designers thought it would because the uh, insulation is not performing like it should have in the first place. And uh, you can see compared to Inselton, the uh, red line is actually on top of the first cycle blue line because you don't see thermal shift at all. Where would I use Inselton um, HT where you have space constraints? It also works very well on large diameter uh, vessels and pipes um, where you may want to be able to replace scored block. Um, it installs pretty quickly on it's a labor savings on those types of applications. And I think that answered the same question as second question as well. How do we handle elbows? We get asked that all the time. We do have um, laser cut pre-designed elbows for uh, mo pretty much all the standard elbow or pipe sizes. Um, what you're seeing here is three layers. We make two piece butterfly type elbows. So there's layer one, two, and three. This is for a six inch um, pipe, iron pipe. And that would be what it looks like when it's installed. Quick and easy. Now mineral wool. Generally, mineral wool has always performed very well with acoustics, mainly because it's a fibrous material. But it, um, uh, if you've got an acoustical issue, mineral wool is your product of choice. It's non-combustible. The lightest weight of all the products we have in terms of densities, and uh, depending on the um, the type you buy, if it's v grooved as opposed to uh, uh, preformed and mandrel wound, you'll see that it um, certainly ship when you ship around something that is typically round, but you're able to ship it flat. You've got a lot of job site storage um, freed up to store a lot more material. We make all kinds of shapes and sizes of mineral wool. Um, basically, it's all the same mineral wool, just in different forms. The top left is our mineral wool 1200 mandrel wound pipe insulation. That product is now water resistant or water repellent. Um, we also make a V grooved uh, pipe insulation in our Houston uh, facility. We make three types preformed, which is already round. It is V grooved, but it's, um, uh, it's stuck. The, the V's are stuck together. It's shipped in the round in a box, just like mandrel wound pipe. We also have field formed, which is shipped flat with glue in the joints. Precision cut, which is um, V groove with no glue. Then we make two types of pipe and tank wrap, um, uh, lamella wrap, and then uh, a regular pipe and tank wrap that just comes off the mineral wool line where the fibers are oriented parallel um, to the pipe. And then uh, several types of uh, industrial boards, various densities and um, length and widths and also metal mesh blankets for very high temperature applications. They perform similarly because they're mainly the same types of fiber. Um, we do not have a corrosion inhibitor in mineral wool. Um, haven't figured out a way to do that yet, but it, like all of our other insulations, operates maximum temperature is 1200 degrees Fahrenheit, and the densities certainly do vary by design. I think I've covered much of this. Once again, to repeat, the only part of this that's water resistant or water repellent is the uh, mandrel wound pipe insulation. There's the board. We also make flexible bats, which are um, boards that are just a little more flexible, easier to wrap around uh, cylindrical applications. And then the pipe and tank wraps and a metal mesh blanket, which is a, a metal on one or both sides. We hear a lot about binder burnout with mineral wool. What is the binder? It's, it's really the additive that, ho that holds the fibers together and gives the fibers their loft. Uh, the binder burnout starts around 350 degrees. The good news about it all is the uh, thermal conductivity doesn't change without the binder. However, the compressive strength is compromised 
And if there's any kind of vibration at all, um, the fibers are going to be much more likely to settle um, where gravity is going to take them, which is probably uh, not where you want it. That pipe on the left is very well insulated on the bottom. And that's the result of a high vibration application. The best, what's the best temperature range for mineral wool? Like, mineral wool is rated to 1,200 degrees, but as I mentioned, the binder um, burnout starts about 450. Something else that happens at 500 degrees is while mineral wool is an excellent um, insulator, the um, insulation value, the thermal conductivity crosses with uh, calcium silicate, for example, at around 500 degrees. So above 500 degrees uh, mean temperature, calcium silicate becomes a better insulator than mineral wool. Um, so uh, depending on your application and what you're picking, it, your insulation, the reasons for is um, uh, the best temperature range for mineral wool ideally is uh, less than 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Can mineral wool be made hydrophobic? Um, not yet, but it is water resistant. Now, I'm going to hand the the baton to Heather. All right, thank you, Jack. Um, so I'm going to be going through um, JM's uh, newest portfolio of uh, low temperature um, insulation and then uh, the jacketing as well. Uh, so here you can see the different products that I'm going to talk about for the foam. We have the Trimer Polyisocyanurate, uh, which you'll hear me refer to as PIR, uh, Trimer 2550, XPS, um, PIB, which is a, an extruded polystyrene, and then the supercell phenolic. So first up is our Trimer polyisocyanurate. It is a fully closed cell foam. Um, its temperature limits are negative 297 up to 300 Fahrenheit. Um, the densities range from 1.8 to 6 pounds, and the compressive strengths range anywhere from 25 up to 140, and those are uh, dependent on the densities. Um, our workhorse is the Trimer 2000 XP. Um, it's the most common density that's used for majority of the mechanical applications, um, such as piping. It's mainly uh, all of the PAR can be used in LNG, uh, chilled water, refrigeration, and uh, cryogenic. And it's manufactured in large bun stocks, which then are sold and fabricated into the pipes in different shapes that you see in the picture above. So where would you um, use different densities? Like I mentioned, the Trimer 2000 is um, most often used in uh, mechanical piping applications. Our Trimer 2500 is used almost exclusively in LNG applications. And then our Trimers 3000, 4000, and 6000 are mainly used in pipe supports and specialty applications, and that's just because of the higher density. I do also want to mention that our Trimer products are ASTM compliant with um, C591. The next product is Trimer 2550. Um, I refer to this as the sister product to the Trimer 2000 XP. Um, it's a new product that is uh, only a couple of years old. It offers the same great performances as the Trimer 2000 um, when it comes to the density of two pounds and the compressive strength of 24. Um, it also has the same temperature range, but what the difference is here between Trimer 2550 and Trimer 2000 is that the 2550 has the 2550 flame smoke rating that ASTM E84 um, requires for uh, plenums. So if you're looking to need that rating inside a plenum, you would be looking at the Trimer 2550 product. It is also manufactured in large bun stocks and then cut to shapes. Um, next is the Trimer Core PIR. They're also uh, known as our L series or our low index series. These have a temperature range of the same as the other Trimer PIR at negative 297 to 300 Fahrenheit. Um, the compressive strengths range from 30 to 75 based on the densities of uh, 2 pounds to 4 pounds. Um, these are also closed cell just as the Trimer uh, PIR as, um, are. Um, applications range from transportation to military shelters and clean room walls, and once again, it is manufactured in large bun stock and then um, cut into the specific shapes needed. Uh, the reason the L series is um, in existence is because it's less dusty and it's got a better flexural strength, 
than the standard um, Trimer PIR products. The extruded polystyrene pipe insulation billet, which is a mouthful, um, we've shortened it to XPS PIB, um, is ASTM uh, compliant to C578. Um, it has a slightly different operating temperature range of negative 196 up to 320. Um, it comes in one compressive strength of 20 PSI uh, with a density of 1.6. Uh, this XPS is often used in refrigeration um, and mainly in food and beverage. Uh, you can see there that it's typically, um, once again, produced in 109-inch, three-foot lengths, um, and then the heights can vary. The next part of the system that um, we now offer is the Serenex CX uh, vapor retarder uh, film and tape. On the left-hand side is the film, and it comes in two different thicknesses, the 540, which is four mils, and the 560, which is six mils. Um, the six mils is stronger and has a lower water vapor permeance of 0.01, whereas the 540 has a permeance of 0.02. Um, it's ideal for any low temperature applications, um, and it's going to help drive that moisture away from the system. So in conjunction with the film, we have the tape. You'll notice that we have a 520 tape, which is two mils thick. Um, it has a permeance of 0.03. And then we've got the coordinating 560 film, which is six mils thick and has that same 0.01 permeance. Um, it comes in both or in all one, two, and three inches wide um, and in 150 long uh, sections. The uh, tape is adhesive back, so there's no release paper. It's like a big tape, uh, big roll of masking tape. So it's very easily applied um, to better fit the elbows in any um, specialty shape, such as valves, that you might need to have a continuous vapor retarder system on. Um, the film can be factory applied or field applied, um, and then uh, it is also then easily applied to the application. Uh, the last insulation is the supercell phenolic. Um, it is a closed cell, rigid foam, uh, once again, that's formed in uh, bun stock. Um, it has the 2550 rating, which is the same as the Trimer 2550. The difference um, is several things. The supercell phenolic is slightly more expensive, and it has the 2550 rating up to three inches of thickness, whereas the Trimer 2550 has that rating up to an inch and a half thickness. The compressive strengths range from 32 to 158. Um, that corresponds to different densities of two and a half to seven and a half. The operating temperature is slightly different than the Trimer PIR. It does have the same lower temperature limit of negative 297, but it only goes up to 257 Fahrenheit, whereas Trimer PIR goes all the way up to 300. Um, typically, these applications are going to be in plenums, and now it would be in plenums where you would need more than an inch and a half of insulation, um, chilled water and commercial. It is also uh, meets the code requirement for ASTM C1126. Okay, so next we're going to move on to the jacketing and accessories. So all of our jacketing is compliant with either ASTM C1729 or 1767 um, for aluminum and stainless steels. You can see here that we um, provide aluminum and steel rolls, sheets, accessories, and elbows. And I'll go into a little bit of detail of each of those. So for rolls, we offer uh, aluminum, painted aluminum, and stainless steel. You can see the different colors here of clear, white, and gray for the painted aluminum. Uh, the stainless steel typically is just its silver, um, and that's simply for the reduced uh, glare that it offers. Finishes in all of these metals can be smooth, corrugated, stucco embossed, or a mixture of those, whichever your preference is. And the metal grades are for aluminum, uh, 3105 or 3003 alloy, and the stainless steel is either 304 or 316. So cut and roll um, is jacketing that has been cut and curled to fit a predetermined um, pipe size. Um, primarily, these are 36 inches wide, but they can also be produced in 48 inches wide as well. Um, there is a half-inch safety hem that can be added uh, with the standard two-inch lap. 
once again, you can get these in any uh, multitude of finishes, combinations of finishes between smooth corrugated and stucco embossed, and it is uh, typically silver. Corrugated sheets can be uh, smooth or stucco embossed, and they're typically stocked in 33 inch width, and you have two choices of corrugation sizes. You've got the one and a quarter um, or the two and a half. Um, the two and a half is typically best suited for heavier, um, used with heavier gauges, such as the 024 or the 040. Um, the next product is, a, is our box rib. Um, it's a four, in, four inch box rib sheet. Um, they come in eight, 10, or 12 foot lengths. Um, the ribs are just gonna add some extra structural support to the jacketing. Uh, the finish is stucco embossed. Um, while we've seen it used in large tank and vessels, it's most commonly uh, used in the power plant application. And you'll notice here that it's um, produced from an all-clad alloy. So the all-clad is an aluminum, which is produced by metallurgically bonding um, the 7072 aluminum alloy to both sides of a 3004 alloy core. Um, a lot of science behind that. But it results in the aluminum composition providing a superior corrosion resistance. So in most of the pictures, oh, nope, I'm just kidding. I'm gonna do elbows first. Um, this is the LJAX Plus. It's our uh, polyfill moisture barrier lined aluminum elbows. They are two pieces, factory preformed. Typically it's an 1100 series alloy um, that's 024 thick. Uh, we make 90s and 45s. Um, they are compliant with the ASTM uh, C1729 standard. Uh, you'll notice that it has uh, two ribs in it, and that increased spacing helps uh, for an easier installation. They also have a very low water vapor transmission rate. Um, the polyfill moisture barrier on the inside of that adds the uh, additional protection from the galvanic and um, pitting corrosion um, that can happen on the interior surface. So as you will have noticed, in most of the metal pictures, you will have seen the underside or the inside of the jacketing with a blue film. Um, that is known as our polyfilm moisture barrier, or PFMB for short. Um, the polyfilm is a co-extrusion of, of a polyethylene and a DuPont or Dow's Serlin. Uh, you can see here that it's got a high density than the Serlin and the low density um, that is heat laminated to the interior of the metal jacketing. It's three mils thick. Um, it is a moisture barrier, uh, not to be mistaken or replaced by a vapor retarder, which we spoke about earlier. Um, it's just gonna offer that additional protection to the inside of the metal jacketing to help any corrosion happen there should water uh, get into the system. Um, and this polyfilm is suited uh, for service on all jacketing applications. Uh, the chart that's up here just kind of shows some differences between the polyfilm on the far right column with um, polycraft, which is often still used and painted. Um, the one most important properties um, I would consider to be the pinholes, which you can see for paint are really great versus polyfilm, which has zero. The water resistance, which you can see for the polyfilm is less than 0.05, so it's got an excellent water resistance compared to um, paint, which we don't even know what it is. Um, and then the flammability, um, it meets a 0.5 for ASTM E84, um, but it's got an auto ignition temperature of greater than 600. I'm going to take over again and just finish up here with a few insulation accessories that Johns Manville has offered through the years. Insulcode ET is a, a uh, breathing mastic. It's a uh, asphalt based, so it's black protective uh, coating for odd sizes and shapes. Um, and it's pretty much, uh, it's often all the time used with a glass mat or a type of a reinforcement. Um, we also have Calvine Gold, which is sodium silicate based glue. It's uh, used for adhering insulation to itself or other insulations. Primary use that uh, folks use it for is gluing miters together when they're cutting fittings. And finally, we have Super or Calcoat, 127, it's an insulating finishing cement, and um, it's used for filling voids, chips, nicks, dings, um, openings in calcil, perlite, mineral wool, and even uh, 
ap applications um, around valve necks or anywhere there's openings that uh, still need insulation to finish the job. And next I'm going to turn the ball over to um, Kim Melton, who's going to, who, who started this show off today and is going to finish up with uh, talking about a few additional resources. All right. Thank you so much, Jack. So if you are looking for more information about this top topic or other educational resources relating to insulation, um, we offer online training, a blog, a specifications portal, and even um, record webinars in our online resource called The Source. And that's what you see on your screen right now. Um, now, the source is where we host all of our recorded webinars, like the one that uh, you attended today. You can watch these on demand or share them with your colleagues who you think might find the information useful. Um, it also hosts our blog that contains original articles written by JM as well as curated content from experts throughout the industry. So we really try to make our blogs as targeted um, and technical and relevant to you as possible. Um, and we do this by making sure that we have, we have uh, uh, good resources for our, for our blog content. Now, there's also a full library of helpful information and documentation on the source. You'll find technical bulletins, white papers, product application guides, et cetera. Now, if you're looking for anything um, highly specific to a, a certain application or a certain product, we strongly encourage you to browse this section. Um, it's because if you're looking for it, uh, this kind of detailed information, it's going to be in there. Also, you'll find the uh, tools section on the website where there are links to download, like our Smart Binder app, um, the NEMA 3E Plus tool, uh, the part tool, and these are all tools that we've designed to help you um, to help you in your in your specification process. So the name of 3E Plus tool can help you to determine the thickness of insulation you need. The Smart Binder app is a tool you can download to your phone that allows you to um, access our our data sheets and our SDSs um, on the fly as needed. And then the part tool, well, uh, Jack showed it earlier on his presentation, um, but that shows you which products to select based on the unique needs and requirements of your application. So you can find a link directly to the source on the HVAC mechanical and industrial pages of Johns Manville. And on the industrial page, you'll see a link on the top left bar menu, is circled there in yellow, and then also on the right side at the bottom of the, um, those, gray, those gray buttons there is the link to the source as well. So um, for everybody who attended today, there will be a certificate of completion. That's going to be um, in your email by Monday. And with that, we are going to go ahead and um, take some questions. We got a lot of good questions that came through. So um, the first one is for you, Heather. And that is, um, why is the lower temperature limit of PIR minus 297 degrees Fahrenheit? So we keep that lower temperature limit um, at, new, at negative 297 because that's the boiling point of oxygen. Um, PIR can be used in uh, much lower temperatures such as LNG and negative 320, um, but we keep that range up there to encourage those to contact technical so that we can make sure that they have an, a complete system, which would include a good vapor retarder. All right, excellent, thank you. The next question is for you, Jack, and that is why should I buy uh, insulation from Johns Manville and not from a Chinese manufacturer? Johns Manville is the only domestic uh, North American insulation manufacturer. And um, we manufactured at ASTM standards um, to, uh, you know, United States codes. And we, probably the greatest advantage is we can deliver. We stock and inventory in two factories and can deliver in days um, rather, than, uh, rather than months. And you can certainly be assured of the quality. Johns Manville's been here for 160 years. And uh, if you ever have an issue, you know who to call. Excellent. Um, so is the insulation under, under discussion today, um, can that be used in pipes carrying gas as well as steam? Jack, why don't you go ahead and start and then Heather, you can wrap Yes, on a, certainly on the high temperature side. As long as the, the, the pipe is operating within the temperature range of the uh, insulation material on the, on the high and the low side, absolutely. I would definitely agree with Jack. You want to make sure that whatever insulation you're using for your system, that it, uh, it falls within that surface temperature. All right, excellent. I'll pose this one to you, Heather. What products are available that are certified for use on aquatherm chilled water piping? I don't know much about aquatherm itself, but once again, if it falls within the temperature range and is a cold water or chilled application, refrigeration, LNG, and it falls within the temperature range, you can pick from any of the PIRs. All right, excellent. Jack, this one is for you, and that is what mineral fiber, mineral fiber products does JM currently offer that are water repellent? 
of, of, the, of, the, of the pipe, the pipe and tank wrap and the board products we make, the only product that's currently water repellent is our mandrel wound pipe insulation manufactured in Phoenix City, Alabama. All right, thank you. Um, the next question is, can I get a catalog of your products or can I find that on the website? Yes, you can get a catalog of the products. Um, that's going to be sent to you right now in the chat function on your, on your, um, on the, the WebEx events here. So you should see that coming up shortly. There will be one for the um, foam and metal products and one for the um, high temperature products. So those are two different, different product catalogs, but those should come to you directly right now in chat. You can also find them on, um, on our website um, from the industrial page. So, uh, Jack, I'm going to pose this one to you, and Heather, if you have anything to add, you can uh, tack on, and that is, at, at what minimum insulation thickness do you consider mul using multiple layers? That, a lot of that's a design consideration by the engineers, um, but there are a couple of things I'll mention. So, uh, typically, we see engineers specifying multiple layers three inches and above. Um, and when I ask engineers why, some of them say, well, that's because the insulation gets heavy, and um, uh, number one. They also say, well, above that, the, the temperatures are, are certainly high, and we want to stagger the joints um, uh, so we don't have any through joints at such high temperatures. It, uh, I, I think it, there's no hard and fast rule. There's nothing in the MICA manual. There's no um, you know, PIP regular. There's no big specification for it. It kind of all depends, but typically it's three inches and above um, is where folks most often go to double layer. Um, I'd add to that for the um, PIR insulations, the cold, the cold applications, that um, we recommend a minimum of a one inch thickness um, for any individual one individual layer, um, and that's simply because of uh, shipping, it's easier to fabricate. Um, so you consider that as well. Um, in our installation guidelines for cryogenic, we have a table in there that would break out if you had uh, two or more layers, how thick each layer might be. All right, excellent, thank you. Jack, the next question is for you, and that is, what is the average life expectancy of calcium silicate and the XOX corrosion inhibitor? Um, I'll do the corrosion inhibitor first. That's for the life of the system. It doesn't, 90% uh, of the chemistry and the ingredients in the thermal 1200 um, make up the corrosion inhibitor, so it's there forever, as long as it's there. And the life expectancy really depends on how well it's maintained and what the, whether it was designed um, you know, with good weatherproofing and jacket systems and the whole thing in the first place. Um, if it's maintained well, it's, you're, you should expect it to last 20, 25 years. Okay. Um, Heather, the next question is for you, and that is, does, Jane, does JM carry stainless steel else? Yes. Uh, when you get up to the larger sizes, um, we do have some size uh, limits. We go um, from a half inch MPS up to 12 inches. When you get to the larger size NPS, um, there are some that are only available in aluminum, um, and those are indicated on our elbow selection guides with an asterisk. Excellent. Jack, the next question is for you, and that is, how does calcium silicate perform on chilled water or refrigerant suction piping? Not well. <laughs> we don't recommend calcium silicate on those, uh, in those temperature ranges. Um, the calcium silicate is a high temperature material. Um, it's uh, certainly not, uh, not, not one that's going to be water resistant for a long period of time in those conditions um, with condensation issues. In fact, it's not even a good insulator um, compared to the other options that are available in those uh, in chilled water and those types of applications. All right, and Heather, can you dive into what some of those other options might be for a chilled water or refrigerant suction piping? Uh, for any application in refrigeration or chilled water, we would probably recommend our Trimer 2000. Um, because of its closed cell nature, um, it's going to be able to provide um, better condensation control at, at some lower thicknesses. Excellent. Um, Jack, do you have any thoughts um, or products for fire resistance? We have uh, our Super Fire Temp um, board products, our L as in Larry and M as in Mary products. Uh, which do have some, some listings for uh, structural steel for fire protection. Um, and we are looking at um, 
uh, running some uh, UL1709 tests on some, some of our other products uh, that will give us a wider range of fire protection applications. But currently, our Super Fire Temp products, which are all coming boards, various densities, are uh, applicable and uh, certified for fire protection. All right. And what thicknesses is Infilthin HT available in? We make two thicknesses, uh, 10 millimeter and uh, 5 millimeter thick. All right. And the rolls are available 36 inches wide and 60 inches wide. Thank you. Heather, the next question is for you, and that is, are there any issues with using st uh, with stainless steel when using polyiso? No, there shouldn't be. All right. Simple and straightforward. I like that. Um, so we got this question. It came through when we were talking about mineral wool, and that was, um, are there any concerns with indoor air quality with these products? Would you like to speak to that, Jack, or would you like me to? I know you've done, you did the webinar, <laughs> I, so I I'll did. let you speak to that one, Kim. Okay, so um, typically mineral wool is not used in, in air handling um, applications. You usually have fiberglass. Both mineral wool fibers and fiberglass fibers have been exonerated um, in terms of concerns about with indoor air quality or um, potential health hazards that could be caused by the fibers being inhaled um, by building occupants. So, no, we don't have any concerns with indoor air quality with our mineral wool products. And from an industrial perspective, um, mineral wool is probably not going to be used indoors in an industrial facility. It's more commonly used on the, um, on the applications that are typically outside. So um, the short answer to that is no. If you want more information on it, there's a, uh, we just did a webinar on it earlier this year. If you look for the, uh, the, the title of the webinar is The Truth Behind the Health and Safety of Fiberglass and Mineral Wool, we actually dive into the science and the research on this, um, this topic at hand, and um, the, we just actually addressed some of the new research that just got released to the market this year. So if you have any more questions on that, um, we would be happy to help you out there. You can certainly reach out to us after the webinar, and we can send you the link to that directly. So, uh, that answers that one. The next question is for you, Jack, and that is, does the hydrophobicity burn out of Sproul 1200 expanded perlite? And the answer is yes, it does. And the, what makes the products hydrophobic or water resistant, water repellent, are all organic materials, and they will burn out of, whether it's our product or our competitors, it's all organics, they will burn out um, and oxidize beginning at 400, 450 degrees Fahrenheit. XOX, again, I want to remind everybody, the corrosion inhibitor does not. It stays. It's there for the life of the system. Excellent. Heather, the next question is for you, and that is, how would you size metal L's when using a thin blanket insulation like Insulson? I think that that is something that we are going to have to work towards. I don't currently have an answer, but the way we size our elbows generally is going to be with the pipe size um, and the insulation thickness. So that's something that we're going to have to work towards. Excellent. We only have one question left, um, and that is, will cow bond stick to Thermo 1200? I've had issues getting glue to adhere due to water resistance and hydrophobicity in industrial insulation materials. Cow bond, it will. Um, you know, cow bond's been used for years with the, uh, certainly, perlite products, which are, are, have been hydrophobic forever, um, and cow bonds work there. Um, it, it, it's also worked on Thermo 12 Gold, obviously. And it does work on thermal 1200 once we made it water repellent. Folks do find, like when they use it with perlite, that they have to rub the two, if we're talking about miters, you have to rub them together um, a little more than you're used to just because it's a little bit, it's got some water resistance to it, uh, to work it into the uh, material to, to grab hold which uh, you didn't have to do it with uh, Thermal 12 Gold because it readily absorbed the, uh, the moisture and the glue. But uh, so it just, you just have to work a little bit more and it, and it will work fine. All right, excellent. Well, everyone, thank you very much for attending today. If you have any additional questions that you did not get answered today, you can actually submit those to us via the survey and we will respond to you directly. Um, you will have a certificate of completion in your um, email inbox by Monday. Other than that, we thank you very much for your time, and we would encourage you to fill out your feedback in the survey and let us know how we did for you today. So have a great week. Take care.